um, I was asked to speak about great power competition in Southeast Asia. Um, and I'm going to cover a number of countries, but I, I, obviously my specialty is Cambodia. So I taught from Cambodia to Timor-Leste uh, and with a few countries in between. Uh, but first, I want to make uh, give a few thanks and, and certainly to uh, Brigadier General Michael T. Rawls, the uh, commandant of the Air War College, who uh, invited and Drs. Anna Bata and, and Dr. Uh, David Sorensen of the Air War College, uh, Ms. Cindy Hawkins, uh, Chief of Protocol, Ms. Diane Day, without whose help I wouldn't be able to have all of this uh, Zoom set up in such a short time, uh, Mr. John Hudak, who is helping with all the tech as well. Um, Dr. Sorensen mentioned the background that I have, a Thunderbird School of Global Management has a pedigree in, uh, in the Air Force. Uh, it, was, it was located for a very long time at uh, Thunderbird Airfield One and founded by um, Barton Kyle Yunt, who was a US Army Lieutenant General uh, and working in the US Army Air Forces before there was a US Air Force. He was the founder of the Thunderbird School of Global Management. And the school was, the creation of, of, of post-World War II, um, like the Bretton Woods institutions in that sense, uh, in the sense that we, the desire was to create more peace. Uh, one of our uh, faculty members uh, is coined the phrase, borders frequented by trade seldom meet soldiers. And I think that the idea for that actually came from uh, a quote by Frederick Bassiat, which allegedly uh, was on a banner at Bretton Woods uh, that said, when goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. And I think that's the, the kind of message that, that Thunderbird now at its new headquarters has, which is how do we use commerce? How do we use diplomacy to bring more peace to the world, to make it less likely that another world war would happen? All right, so I've been asked about great power competition. I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to speaking on, on this idea. The, the modern era uh, can be defined, seen as being defined by great power competition, which is a, a competition for power between the US military and rival powers such as China and Russia through military, political, and economic means. Why are we competing? Shouldn't we be asking that? And what are we competing over? Competing for what, over what? Uh, oftentimes we kind of cut to the chase um, and say, you know, how do we achieve victory? Uh, and, and, you know, asking these questions is important. Uh, some, some of the possible answers, of course, are entirely reasonable, like Western states should engage in collective defense of liberal democracy or to somewhat more dangerous and, un, uh, and unrealistic ideas like Washington should be pursuing regime collapse in Beijing. It, it's, it's hardly something we should ignore, but we should, we should at least think about these things. And when we look at... Uh, some of the driving documents that, that define our military strategy. Uh, the 2015 National Military Strategy of the US, for example, says that some states, however, are attempting to revise key aspects of the international order and are acting in a manner that threatens our national security interests. Back in 2015, there was no such use of uh, great power competition. It was, it was, it was not even on, in the lexicon uh, it was really not until a, a couple of years later in Secretary of Defense, then Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis's um, uh, testimony to the House Armed Services uh, Committee in 2017 that he said, a return to great power competition marked by a resurgent and more aggressive Russian Federation and a rising more confident and assertive China places the international order under assault. Both uh, Russia and China object to key aspects of the international order so painstakingly built since the end of World War II. He's referring, of course, to the Bretton Woods institutions, the things, the liberal order that was created after the Second World War. Both countries are making their objections known by challenging established international norms, such as freedom of the seas and the sovereignty of nations on their periphery. Uh, that uh, same year, the National Security Strategy of the US stated, Quote, after being dismissed as a phenomenon of an earlier century, great power competition returned. China, Russia began to reassert their influence regionally and globally 
Today, they are fielding military capabilities designed to deny America access in times of crisis and to contest our ability to operate freely in critical commercial zones during peacetime. In short, they're contesting our geopolitical advantages and trying to change the international order in their favor. So the metaphor or the, the vision here is what used to be a Cold War in Europe could be shifting in a worst case scenario to Southeast Asia. And we know, of course, that perhaps the, the real narrative is competition among great powers cannot return because it never really went away. That's a quote from Professor Daniel Nexon uh, of Georgetown University. Um, all of this actually comes from an article uh, by um, Emily Ashford in uh, Foreign Policy, in which she argues that instead, the return of great power competition is essentially an easier way of admitting that the United States is in relative decline. The unipolar moment, the three decade period of US global uh, predominance that started with the collapse of the Soviet Union is ending. In the parlance of political science, other states are beginning to balance against the United States. In layman's terms, this means that with the United States in relative decline, other states are increasingly willing to take actions they would not have during the 1990s, whether it's Russian intervention in Syria. Of course, she did not know that Russia would invade Ukraine by because uh, it was written uh, a year ago. Um, uh, Chinese claims to the South China Sea, on which I'll talk about, or European steps to circumvent US sanctions legislation. And of course, this is the idea that the Cold War really never ended. Ukraine, uh, the China challenge, and, and really in that sense, the response, the revival of the West for, for, um, for the United States and, and other Western nations. So we're looking, of course, at the Asia chessboard and the competition between uh, great powers, uh, the United States, and rising powers like China, which are narrowing the, 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 the straits in, in that sense, literally. Uh, and it's causing, of course, countries in Southeast Asia to want uh, China, which is claiming uh, all of the South China Sea through the Nine Dash Line to get out of that, uh, of that claim, to no longer take uh, all of those uh, waters as theirs. Uh, but it isn't, of course, just China, right? I mean, here, you have protesters in the Philippines saying U.S., China out of the Philippines soils and seas. So um, in that sense, it's, it's, it's a narrative that the locals in Southeast Asia have that essentially they're between a rock and a hard place. They have to choose which country and they don't actually want to choose. They would love to simply say, we love everybody and we, we, we want to get resources and, and, and money and investment from everyone and aid from everyone. But to give you a little bit of an idea of, of the Southeast Asian uh, uh, picture in terms of the ethnic Chinese hold on the economy. Now, I'm not talking about people with a, with a Chinese passport here, although some of them would have that, but I'm talking about ethnic Chinese who live in these countries and how much they hold uh, over the economy. This is a fascinating uh, graphic here with uh, you know 76% of Burma's economy uh, uh, held by ethnic Chinese Laos here, 99%, Vietnam, 41%, Thailand, 81%, Cambodia, 92%, the Philippines, 62%. Uh, it's only where you get here to, the, uh, to Malaysia, 63%, uh, Brunei. Of course, Singapore is, is mostly ethnic Chinese uh, and Indonesia, 71%, that you see sort of the extent to which, and I'm not saying the ethnic Chinese there are loyal somehow to Beijing, but obviously, it creates tensions where the people who actually are ethnic, uh, say uh, Malay, uh, or who are uh, you know Filipino and not ethnic Chinese, would would have some tension over the fact that the control over the economy, which of course doesn't always translate to power in terms of politics, but the control of the economy means control over uh, financial resources, and in the Indo-Pacific region, you know. We see 61% of the world's population, uh, 15 of the 30 world's mega cities, seven of the top 15 US trading partners and five US uh, security treaties, uh, which uh, are very important obviously to the United States. These treaty alliances with Japan, uh, the Republic of Korea, Australia, the Philippines and, and Thailand form the cornerstone of our strategic position in the Asia Pacific. This slide is actually straight out of a State Department website uh, that I uh, that I took. Um, so 
we're hosting actually in mid-May, May 12th to the 13th, uh, the US ASEAN Special Summit. And here you have the statement of Jen Psaki, uh, the press secretary uh, of uh, the president saying that President Biden will host the leaders of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations in Washington, DC on May 12th and 13th. And of course, they've got a list in there. Uh, it's to celebrate the 45 years of US ASEAN relations. It is to talk about $102 million in new initiatives to expand our engagement with ASEAN on COVID-19 recovery and health security, fighting the climate crisis, stimulating broad-based economic growth, promoting gender equality, and deepening people-to-people -people ties. On the ASEAN side, uh, Cambodia is the chair of ASEAN this year in 2022. And of course, it already made waves by doing things that other ASEAN members were not happy about. The first step, the chair of ASEAN, Prime Minister Hun Sen of Cambodia did was to go to Myanmar and to try somehow to solve this problem himself, which of course was not the desire at all of, 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 of fellow ASEAN members. Uh, but here, uh, the same message in terms of you know, COVID-19 response, global health security, climate change, sustainable development, maritime cooperation, which of course is a reference to the South China Sea without saying the word South China Sea and uh, human capital development, education, and people to people ties. So very much the same kind of language. And I was asked about the fact that uh, it said that the US and ASEAN are to become uh, comprehensive strategic partners when I was, I think asked by the Voice of America about this a few days ago. And so I had to, to research what the status of, of various countries was to ASEAN and to certain member states. So China is already a comprehensive uh, strategic partner of ASEAN. Uh, India is a comprehensive strategic partner of the United States. Uh, Vietnam calls 14 countries its strategic partners and three additional countries, China, Russia, and India, uh, comprehensive strategic partners. Uh, the US, oddly enough, is a comprehensive partner of Vietnam, along with Argentina, Denmark, and Hungary. Uh, and I think this move, of course, is, is the US playing catch up in the sense of elevating the relationship with ASEAN. Uh, of course, words have meaning, uh, and it's important to upgrade relationships meaningfully. Uh, ASEAN needs to balance away from China. I think that the US would be uh, a comprehensive strategic partner of Vietnam's, given how closely the two countries have engaged one another uh, to essentially counterbalance China. I mean, in, in, in the Southeast Asian region, Vietnam is the one country that isn't playing along uh, and, and wants very much to, to, to not have China dominate. Um, there are, as I mentioned previously, several treaty partners, Japan, 1952, revised in 1960, South Korea, 1953, Philippines, 1951, Thailand, 1951, Australia and New Zealand in 1951, and the Republic of China on Taiwan in 1954. These are, these are meaningful, obviously. We're not, we're not talking about anything like this for ASEAN. But of course, two members of ASEAN are named above, the Philippines and Thailand. And so really, I think anything is realis realizable. What matters is not the label, it's, it's really the, the reality of that relationship. If we think, for example, about the special relationship the US has with the UK. I mean, you can say it's a special relationship, but it doesn't characterize really the meaning of that relationship, uh, it, which is really deep and historical. Uh, we were a colony, we uh, declared independence from, uh, from the UK, uh, and so, I mean, obviously it, it, it's a long history, but we've since become so close as a result. And all of the more recent um, uh, shifts in Asia uh, towards, uh, with respect to, to the US view has been from this uh, perceived pivot to Asia that began under the Obama administration. And it's really uh, a pivot to counter China's impact on US treaty allies like Japan and, and the other treaty allies that I mentioned, and by extension, where China is taking Southeast Asia and what that means for America in terms of counterbalancing again, uh, the, the, whether the Chinese dragon or the Chinese panda. So the, the pivot is, is in large part about China's rise. It's about China's return to its sphere of influence, which it considers Southeast Asia to be. When we think about the Monroe Doctrine for the United States, Latin America, South America is America's backyard. China sees Southeast Asia as its backyard and wants to exert dominance over that area. Uh, when President Obama announced a pivot 
he talked about our goal is not to counter China. Our goal is not to contain China. Our goal is to make sure international rules and norms are respected. And that includes in the area of international disputes. So what, what dispute is he talking about? Of course, he's talking about the, the South China Sea. Uh, and in that sense, the territorial sovereignty, contention on energy, the threat to maritime security and overlapping maritime claims are the core of the South China Sea dispute. And really uh, the cornerstone of that is, is, is thought to be this exclusive economic zone that uh, countries claim over their, their coastal waters. Uh, and this EEZ, if you look at this map, doesn't look so bad uh, you know, from this uh, perspective here, but as you zoom in, certainly in Southeast Asia, you'll see that it's, it's overlapping and very problematic. Uh, depending on what one claims in terms of their territorial uh, land. Um, so this EEZ is, is an exclusive economic zone that is a sea zone prescribed by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, over which a state has special rights over the exploration and use of marine resources, including energy production from water and wind, stretches from the seaward edge of the state's territorial sea out to 200 nautical miles from its coast. Uh, the colloquial usage of the term may include the territorial sea and even the continental shelf beyond the 200 mile limit. The US is not a signatory to UNCLOS uh, while China signed on June 7th, 1996. So uh, you're well aware it's simply that water out to 200 nautical miles, possibly more. And Deng Xiaoping, when he was alive, said, since we cannot solve uh, the South China Sea dispute, we can leave it to the next generation, which will be smarter. And uh, I considered that kicking the can down the road because uh, now we're left with uh, Xi Jinping, who of course is pushing hard on the South China Sea and uh, solving it the way that he sees it, which is China's rising power is becoming a great power and therefore it's going to claim uh, through the nine dash line as much or if not all of the South China Sea. Uh, from a legal standpoint, China's EEZ and Continental Shelf Act of 1998 really, for them, means that they 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 believe that they have this and this 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 these 200 nautical miles. They're following the uh, uh, UNCLOS, and so it's problematic when one thinks about uh, about all of this ocean. That the U.S. position, of course, is that this ought to be not the claim of the of china but of all parties that have the right to travel in that in in those waters so the us has protested the sovereignty claim as a violation of international law uh, it's exercised vigorous freedom of navigation program it regards these as excessive claims by coastal states of jurisdiction over ocean space or international passages and uh, it intends to demonstrate their, the US's right and determination to continue sailing and flying over this disputed region. Of course, it's more than just flying and sailing over these disputed regions. For China, it's about uh, 213 billion barrels of oil. South China Sea has 30 billion metric tons of oil, 16 trillion cubic meters of gas. And China itself only has about 2 billion metric tons of proven oil reserves and 2.8 trillion cubic meters of natural gas. I'm not gonna do the, the math in public, but you can see it would expand by multiple times uh, its, uh, its, its resources if it were to successfully take uh, the South China Sea. And so of course the Philippines and other countries don't want that to happen. They are also claimants to the South China Sea, Vietnam as well, uh, its oil rigs are out there. Uh, and its people, uh, from a, a nationalist perspective, want the Paracel Islands and the Spratlys uh, to belong to Vietnam so that they can claim the resources there as well. Um, and look, uh, you know, the Spratlys, what are they? 250 uninhabitable, uninhabitable islets spread over uh, 165,000 square miles that are claimed by China, Taiwan, Vietnam, and in part by Malaysia, Brunei, and the Philippines. And so we find ourselves with situations where you know basketball courts are built on on helipads in the middle of the ocean uh, and when you zoom into the south china sea itself the the question really is if everybody's claiming a piece of it or china's claiming all of it this becomes totally overlapping in, in nature in terms of the 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 the, the amount of of contention uh, you see china's claim here philippines claim there and so it becomes very problematic. And of course, 
countries like Indonesia uh, have been very displeased in the past. Uh, they are also a claimant country. And um, you know, in 2012, I remember the the hot piece of real estate was Scarborough Shoal, uh, which really uh, puts one you know like if water exceeds the the top of of that little rock there, it's not technically anything that can belong in the category of an island. Uh, but here you have it. I mean, Scarborough Shoal um, with Chinese fishing vessels at the time uh, and Chinese uh, uh, surveillance. Uh, and this dispute, of course, it could, could trigger all kinds of things. I mean, it, uh, China deployed 100 ships uh, on Scarborough Shoal. And the narrative for the Filipinos was that China's plan, Scarborough Shoal, Scarborough today, tomorrow the world. At the time, um, President Ninoy uh, Aquino here trying to shake the hand of uh, the defense minister of China at the time, Liang uh, Wangli, who says China never intends to threaten any nation. Uh, but the response of, of ASEAN is perpetually one of China uh, as one, a gang of one, and ASEAN as really 10 fish pretending to be one, uh, a school of fish really. And there's going to be division. The way that ASEAN operates in terms of uh, consensus makes it impossible. If, if China can buy out, co-opt one or two members of ASEAN, uh, you end up essentially with the inability to, um, to have consensus. And that's exactly what happened 10 years ago uh, in Phnom Penh when Cambodia last shared um, ASEAN, because at that uh, you know, East Asian summit, uh, foreign ministers meeting uh, in July, for example, uh, ASEAN couldn't come up with a uh, joint communique at the end. And oftentimes this is what ASEAN looks like. Right? So uh, on July 12th, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations failed to reach consensus on handling disputes in the South China Sea, uh, reflecting a rift between China and the US over rules to keep peace in the trade lane. Uh, Cambodia, which at the time held the group's rotating chairmanship rejected a compromise on the wording of a joint communique among the other nine members in Phnom Penh. And for the then Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of uh, Indonesia, uh, it was, it was, he said, this is strange territory for me. It's very, very disappointing that at this 11th hour, ASEAN is not able to rally around a certain common language on the South China Sea. We've gone through so many problems in the past, but we've never failed to speak as one. We thought this was gonna be the worst of it in July of 2012, but by November of 2012, it got even worse. Uh, the Cambodian government spokesperson told the media uh, that Southeast Asian leaders had decided that they will not internationalize the South China Sea from now on. And that term not internationalize or internationalize is one that came straight out of China script. It was uh, the words out of the mouth of the uh, spokesperson uh, of the Chinese government. Uh, who said, we oppose the internationalization of the South China Sea. And what is meant by that? It, it's meant that we're not going to want to involve the UN in this. We're not gonna, we just want bilateral negotiations. China versus the Philippines, China versus Vietnam, China versus Indonesia, China versus whichever other country is a claimant country. And in that sense, it was to their advantage. Um, the, the allegation, of course, was that there was a Chinese seat at the ASEAN table, courtesy of Cambodia. And even these figures are, are now uh, uh, eclipsed by how much China has really aided Cambodia, invested in Cambodia through the Belt and Road Initiative, and, and really, in, in effect, bought out Cambodia. Uh, uh, Ninoy Aquino was, uh, was quoted as saying, there were several views expressed yesterday on ASEAN unity, which we did not realize would be translated into an ASEAN consensus. For the record, this was not our understanding. The ASEAN route is not the only route for us. As a sovereign state, it is our right to defend our national interests. Of course, he would soon be uh, replaced by uh, uh, Duterte, who would take a very different approach initially. Uh, at that time, uh, the Philippines had just launched a, a, um, a claim at the permanent court of arbitration against China, which China refused to participate in. And so in 2016, uh, four years later, Cambodia blocks mention of the permanent court of arbitration ruling in favor of the Philippines in an ASEAN joint communique with Laos as chair. Um, so the, the Chinese influence on Cambodia, certainly, uh, I mentioned, has been significant. It's been in garments, construction, telecommunications, fiber optics, pharmaceuticals, gold mining, oil, agro industry, you name it. And it's really part of 
uh, what has been colloquially termed as a string of pearls that China is interested in uh, in, in putting together and stringing together through uh, Southeast Asia and Asia, these naval uh, facilities. Now, of course, they're supposedly just ports uh, for of a commercial nature, whether it's uh, Wandar uh, or Hambantota or in Cambodia, uh, Dara Sakor or Riem. Uh, it's part of that one belt, one road. Uh, and uh, in countries uh, as small as, uh, as Timor-Leste, uh, where, uh, which achieved independence in 2002, China's influence has been very strong. Um, this is Timor-Leste, a half of an island uh, in what used to be uh, part of Indonesia. Uh, the Chinese embassy there, uh, when I worked in Timor-Leste for the United Nations, and here the US embassy, which is uh, the former residence of the Portuguese governor of Timor-Leste. I used to play tennis uh, in the courts right over here. And it was, it was actually fascinating to watch uh, how the Chinese engaged with Timor-Leste. They built, of course, projects. They did the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Timor-Leste, a, a building that I'm sure is likely full of listening devices because uh, Chinese workers built this for them. And, and so uh, here, the presidential palace of Timor-Leste also built by the Chinese for, for that country. And the interest of China is in uh, resources. China already has uh, the largest embassy in Dili Timor uh, and, the, and the Chinese oil company uh, BGP has conducted seismic surveys onshore and in undisputed uh, Timorese waters. Uh, Timor sees China with its huge energy needs as an important prospective client and Australia could lose out to China. Of course, you know the Timor Gap <clears throat> is some of the deepest waters out there for submarine uh, travel. So it's really, I think, quite fascinating to see that. And of course, it's part of that great power competition. China is exerting its influence and, and using its resources to, uh, to convince countries in Southeast Asia to side with it. But you know, it's not all rosy scenario. I mean, it's not here are resources and everybody uh, is happy with it. Uh, there are contentious issues involving uh, the use of dams, for uh, mainland countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, so it's oil and water in that sense. Uh, and and China has built a lot of dams on the Mekong, on its uh, portion of the Mekong, which have affected downriver countries like Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, um, and Burma, Myanmar, and, and, and Cambodia. And even if it's essentially been able to convince Cambodia otherwise, there are perennial droughts. Uh, is it because of climate change or is it because of dams? And so as a result, I think China is also cognizant of the fact that it needs to be, and, and has been very generous from a long time now, for a long time with respect to Cambodia, giving, uh, for example, the Senate complex here. So in 1998, uh, there was an election that was very contentious in Cambodia. And so they had to create positions for people and they created an, an entirely new Senate uh, as an institution. And of course they needed a building. So the Chinese, did a, a Cambodian Senate complex, which, which has its own golf range. Uh, a decade later, just like clockwork, the Chinese build a uh, tomb-like Council of Ministers building, uh, architecturally brutalist, I would say. Uh, and the prime minister of Cambodia was supposed to occupy that, that kind of pyramid here. And here. He, he said the feng shui was not right. And so he, he had another building built next to it for himself. But like clockwork, uh, just last year, the Ministry of National Defense of Cambodia had a new building uh, donated, uh, built by, by China, which is yet again part of that you know, straight out of Beijing architecture um, uh, structure here. Uh, at its core, it's, it's really a story about the golden rule, which uh, for those of you uh, unaware would normally be, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But here it really means he who has the gold makes the rules. Um, and so uh, Hun Sen, the prime minister of Cambodia has flown right when the pandemic hit in March of uh, 2020, he flew immediately uh, to, uh, to China to shake the hand of Xi Jinping, who said a friend in need is a friend indeed. And of course, you know, China has hosted uh, and Vietnam has, uh, and Laos here hosted, but you know, the, the, the special, the foreign minister's meetings on, on COVID-19, which would soon stop being in person and turn into um, uh, virtual meetings. 
but it's really China's game. And in Cambodia, you can see that happening. You see the, the meetings that Cambodia has held with uh, Chinese military counterparts, uh, and then meetings in China uh, that have been <clears throat> hosted by, Chinese, um, by the Chinese military. And it's about displaying uh, kind of China's sort of military uh, prowess in a small country like Cambodia of 17 million people to really frighten the people of Cambodia into submission in that, you know, if you are about to have an election, invariably a month before that election, there's going to be Chinese personnel, military exercises all of a sudden. This is the independence monument of Cambodia, surrounded by, uh, uh, by uh, military uh, from China. And, and this Chinese uh, presence in Cambodia has been ongoing. I mean, during the Khmer Rouge period, uh, China and Cambodia were brothers in arms. Uh, you know, the Khmer Rouge killed a quarter of the population of Cambodia, including my father. I have a missing brother. It's not, it, it, Cambodian people have a very long uh, history in, in believing that the, the Chinese were involved and deeply engaged in supporting the Khmer Rouge. And of course, it's, it's been you know, a first wave of investment in the garment industry, a shift towards energy mining, agriculture and real estate, and now to hydroelectric power expansion that's financed by China. And, um, and of course, development finance and soft loans. So China's going global, we know that. It's got this Belt and Road Initiative. It's, it's, it's possibly a trillion dollars that it's lending out. Now it's not free money, mostly it's, it's, it's maybe, com it's commercial in nature, so it can't be counted as, as uh, development aid. And uh, you know, it spans uh, uh, Europe as well uh, in, its, in its impact. So I mentioned these, the, the port of Guadar, Habantota port, Kokong New port, all commercially not viable. I mean, there, there's, uh, the, it's not profitable, but they're in, they, they made loans, which then in the case of Habantota uh, became equity. So uh, a debt equity swap. And you know, the, the sources of aid for Cambodia have been significantly uh, pronounced when it comes to China. I mean, the, the, the increase there uh, in the 2010s, for example, was, was really a big influence and, and it's replaced Japan as the biggest donor to the country. I, I don't know if any of you have seen this, this video that China put out on the Belt and Road, but I'll just play it here. It's got a little wormy tune uh, 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 that catches your brain and, and makes you wanna kind of, want, want, you wanna get rid of it from your head, but I'm sorry, I'm gonna play it and then we'll move on from there. I think that's enough of that. Um, there's, 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 an, there's, a, there's a John Oliver version of the song, which is not uh, PG rated. And I will not play it here, but you can look for it online on YouTube if you want to see. That's kind of his version of this song, but with what he thinks to be, in fact, the true narrative of what's happening. Um, they also have a, a story time video of you know, how to explain the Belt and Road to your child, I suppose, or to a, uh, somebody who wouldn't understand. Uh, it's cute. Uh, but it really presents an image that I think is more uh, simple than, than, than the reality. And for China, it's this win, 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 win. I mean, it's four wins. It's this excess Chinese capital invested, uh, no tender process or tender to Chinese firms. Uh, the employment of Chinese workers, men of whom China has too many of because of its uh, you know, sex selection uh, practices, um, who need spouses, who then might even find spouses while working in countries like Cambodia and elsewhere. And if things go wrong, as I mentioned, the debt equity swap that happened in Sri Lanka with a 99 year lease. So Hamban Toda port there uh, uh, leased over to uh, China for 99 years, the tune of $292 million. Um, Vice President Pence at the time said, in fact, China uses so-called debt diplomacy to expand, expand its influence. Today, that country is offering hundreds of millions of dollars 
uh, and hundreds of billions, uh, offering hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, I think that might be an order of magnitude of in, in infrastructure loans uh, to governments from Asia to Africa to Europe and even Latin America. Uh, and he references um, uh, the uh, Hambantoto port. There's of course airports as well in, in Sri Lanka here, the world's emptiest airport, of course, after COVID, you know, there were many empty airports and it's not just roads, bridges, empty airports and ports. There's private investment in high rise condos, uh, 150 casinos and more than Vegas. Um, really, I mean, how, how many casinos does one need? Just in, this, in the port city of Sihanoukville, uh, there's 156 hotels, of which 150 are Chinese-owned, uh, 436 restaurants, of which 414 are Chinese-owned, uh, 62 casinos, of which 48 are, are Chinese-owned, and 41 karaoke clubs, and 46 massage parlors. And you can see that in, the, in, in, in Diamond Island in terms of these high-rise condos. This, at night, uh, there's barely any light because nobody actually lives in these condos. Um, Ghost cities are uh, as units snapped up and left empty, driving up real estate. Xi Jinping himself said houses are built to be inhabited, not for speculation. But obviously what, what's happening with investors is they see a way of parking their money outside of China through these through purchase of, of, of condos and other real estate in places like Cambodia. I think one of the driving narratives, uh, and I'll close soon because uh, we're hidden the 45 minute mark, um, uh, is that uh, you know for China and for Russia and for Cambodia and for so many other countries that are part of this uh, this narrative? Uh, uh, in 2009, Xi Jinping said there are a few foreigners with full bellies who have nothing better to do than try to point fingers at our country. China does not export revolution, hunger, poverty, nor does China cause you any headaches. Just what else do you want? He was speaking um, off the record, technically at. Uh, uh, at the Chinese embassy, I believe in Mexico, during a Latin American trip when he was vice president and, and increasing his sort of public profile. And that quote, I think, says a lot. It says that China sees this, especially the export revolution part. It's some, something that, that we've seen Putin use, um, you know, where he, he, th he says, you know, what the West wants is regime change. Uh, and certainly what Cambodia has used in terms of declaring that it's color revolution that the, that the West wants of, of Cambodia, uh, and it feeds into that narrative. So it puts the grievance around this this idea of we're the victim, uh, uh, you know, we're the victims of the West. Um, and you know, in in places like Cambodia, it it's using resources like China's ability to surveil and monitor internet traffic. So the Prime Minister of Cambodia. Uh, says, you know, he can arrest anybody within seven hours within the country for posting on Facebook something that he doesn't like. Uh, and, and surely enough, it happened. Um, San Rota 29 was sent to pretrial detention at Kapung Cham Provincial Prison for calling the Cambodian government authoritarian in a video posted online on Facebook, which of course, if you call somebody authoritarian and they arrest you, well, that would be irony, right? I mean, it's the definition of irony because you've just proven that they're authoritarian. Um, but, uh, you know, even with special summits like the ASEAN Australia Special Summit in 2018, uh, Hun Sen said that he'd send people to beat up protesters, Cambodian and Australian protesters who were displeased with his rule. I mean, this is in Australia. He's saying that he's going to send people out there to beat them up. And to give you just sort of an, a perspective on how, how, strange as all is, he's even said, you know, ASEAN without Hun Sen is not ASEAN. I'll just give the reason that I'm busy with the election. Hun Sen can veto a joint statement between ASEAN and Australia. Of course, like a lot of these autocrats, he speaks in the third person referring to himself. Uh, if you do something improper, Cambodia alone can make the statement get stuck. I would like to send a message in advance that if Cambodia does not agree, it means the statement will be impossible. So that's very problematic, obviously. And, and, and I think it says that, you know, Cambodia has become a kind of extension of China, a province of China. Is it a wholly owned subsidiary? I'm, I'm not an alarmist, but this was Dan Coates, uh, director of national intelligence in 2019 in his worldwide threat assessment saying that Cambodia's slide toward autocracy, which culminated in the Cambodian People's Party retention of power and complete dominance of the national legislature opens the way for a constitutional amendment that could lead to a Chinese military presence. 
And we have seen that possibility uh, certainly in Cambodia with, with the construction of, of the longest airfield uh, in Cambodia, which, which quickly became, um, uh, uh, which quickly alarmed the US because, you know, why do you need an airfield in the middle of the jungle? Uh, you're bringing tourists there. Uh, there's not enough tourists in the world to go visit that area. And so it's resulted in, in global Magnitsky human rights accountability, targeted sanctions on, on the on Cambodian generals who were involved um, in that construction. And so it's not, it's not just sanctions, of course, but leading by example for the United States as a, as a great power towards that more perfect union. And you can see that in Secretary of, of State Anthony Blinken uh, saying, uh, in Alaska when he spoke to his counterpart. And there's one more hallmark of our leadership here at home. And that's a constant quest to, as we say, form a more perfect union. And that quest by definition acknowledges our imperfections, acknowledges that we're not perfect. We make mistakes, we have reversals, we, have, we take steps back. But what we've done throughout our history is to confront those challenges openly, publicly, transparently, not trying to ignore them, not trying to pretend they don't exist, not trying to sweep them under a rug and sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's ugly, but each and every time we have come out stronger, better, more united as a country. So I think, I think it's fascinating to look at great power competition between China and the United States, a kind of narrative of, um, of you know, here are resources, here's a way to get Cambodia to, to, uh, to do China's bidding. And of course, Cambodia is all too happy to take those resources. Uh, that, that great power competition has put Cambodia in the China columns for now, I would say. Uh, I mean, you know, Cambodia is, is distributing uh, Xi Jinping's uh, governance of China books translated into Khmer. So there's, there's definitely a desire to show credibility from that standpoint that Cambodia is really, really supporting of, of, of Xi. And of course, that reminds us of, of how much of that was, you know, the little red book in the past, right? Uh, Mao's little red book. But, um, but things are, of course, problematic uh, uh, domestically for Cambodia. And, th and this is why I think Cambodia does this. Um, they've had a lot of, of individuals who've been assassinated, you know, um, uh, labor activists, Chievichia, environmental activists, Chibwati, political commentator, Kem Le, uh, and uh, nobody's solved uh, the murders. Nobody seems to know anything. Uh, and the prime minister of Cambodia keeps saying, at, meetings like the World Economic Forum, let us solve our problems ourselves. Uh, countries which are outside of the region always slap our heads and tell us what to do. Uh, I raise this issue not as a message for any particular country, he says, but I would like to say that these Macon countries are the political victims. So I request outsiders of the region who don't know about the issues, let us solve our problems. Myanmar is accused of genocide, but do you all understand about Myanmar? Do you know about Myanmar? They have to solve a lot of challenging issues in, the, in relation with security. And the countries that do not know our countries, please leave us to solve our problems ourselves. And of course, he goes off and does uh, this past uh, few months, uh, this cowboy diplomacy with, with, with uh, Myanmar and meets up with, with uh, Myanmar's leader. Of course, that has created all kinds of reaction. No cowboy diplomacy. Hun Sen, go back or, or don't side with the murderer, uh, protesters have said. But I'll, I'll close with you know, really a, a narrative here of, of, of just how problematic it all has been. And, and uh, the authorities in Cambodia, of course, use that same argument, the color revolution, as being what the West wants for Cambodia. And that's why they have to, to fight this. And of course, it's been helpful that, um, uh, you know, the word fake has been in the lexicon uh, in, 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 of late. Uh, so here in that same report, Hun Sen says, quote, real democracy in Cambodia has not been set back or fallen. Instead, it's been protected and strengthened in accordance with the principle of the rule of law for the great benefit of the people and nation. Only fake democracy has been abolished. And that's, that's really how autocrats can take a truth and turn it into lies and make lies and turn them into truth. And how uh, a leader who, who, whose salary is officially something like $2,000 a month can wear a Patek Philip watch valued at 1.2 to $3 million while his opposition uh, uh, leader there who's in exile and can't return to Cambodia wears a, a $5 watch. And Bon Rani, who is Hun Sen's uh, wife, wears a Richard Neal 
valued at a hundred to four hundred thousand dollars. And by the way, that that particular four hundred ten is only one of like at least half a dozen uh, million dollar plus watches he wears. Um, so, anyways, I, I'm going to stop here and take questions because I think I'm uh, slightly over my forty five minutes, and and I'm really happy again to to speak to you all. Thank you.